double dip <laughs> double displacement reactions and precipitation reactions. Double displacement and precipitation reactions. Okay, so let's just remind ourselves a little bit about double displacement reactions. So we did this in the previous video. So a double displacement reaction occurs when you take two ionic compounds, you switch partners, so you switch the cation on one with the anion on the other, and then do the same thing with the other compound, um, and then you're going to get two new ionic compounds as products. And one of the characteristics of these reactions is that you have, you have two compounds as reactants and you have two different compounds as products. Now, predicting whether a double displacement reaction occurs is a little more difficult than predicting a single replacement reaction. Now, there is one type that we can predict and that is called the precipitation reaction. And basically, this happens when you have two ionic compounds dissolved in water and they form a new ionic compound that does not dissolve in water. So for instance, you have two soluble ionic compounds, they totally dissolve in water, and then once you create those two new products, one, usually just one of them, um, forms an ionic compound that is insoluble or does not dissolve. Now, that new compound that falls out of solution as a solid is called a precipitate. So if it doesn't dissolve, it's going to be a solid in your reaction and it's going to fall out of solution and be at the bottom of your flask and it's going to be called a precipitate. Now, that is the driving force for making that reaction go. So basically, you're taking strontium, in this case, strontium and sulfate ions out of solution, forming a solid, and that reaction is going to proceed um, and you're going to end up also with a soluble sodium chloride in, um, in solution. Now, how do we know which compounds precipitate and form a solid? And that is where solubility rules come in. So you've seen the chart of solubility rules. Uh, this is where we're going to actually use them. Now, basically those solubility rules tell us what kinds of ionic compounds form precipitates. Um, and so they'll tell us which ionic compounds are soluble, so which ones dissolve in solution, and they also tell us which ones are insoluble or do not dissolve in solution. So here they are. Now, these are, the, these are helpful to, you know, get very familiar with, not necessarily, you know, memorize, but definitely get to where you can use these easily. So let's just go through them a little bit so you know how to interpret what's written here. Now, the first heading says these compounds generally dissolve in water. So they're soluble. Now, what we're gonna do is look at the cases where this is generally true. So if you have um, lithium cations, sodium cations, potassium cations, rubidium, cesium, and ammonium cations, all of those compounds, if that cation is involved, it's gonna be soluble. And notice under the exceptions column, there are none, no exceptions. If you have nitrate or acetate compounds, you know, with these polyatomics, remember your polyatomics, they're very important, then they're going to dissolve with no exceptions. If you have compounds with chloride anion, bromide, or iodide, we've seen a lot of this so far, those are going to be generally soluble, so they're going to dissolve, but if they happen to be paired with silver, so silver chloride, for instance, or mercury, any one of those, or lead, then they will not be soluble. So what you want to do is find the general rule, whether it's soluble or not, and so they're generally soluble, but if they happen to be paired with these cations, they are going to be insoluble. Same with sulfate generally soluble, but if it's with mercury, lead, strontium, or barium, then it's going to be insoluble. Now, the second heading um, gives us basically the opposite case. So basically carbonates and phosphates are considered insoluble unless, and so these exceptions are for these are actually soluble. So for instance, carbonates and phosphates 
are insoluble unless the cation is lithium, sodium, potassium, rubidium, cesium, or ammonium. Okay, so because remember, all of those guys are soluble with no exceptions, even carbonate or phosphate. Um, if it's a compound of hydroxide, then insoluble unless the cation is one of these. And notice there's a couple of extra ones. There's strontium and barium on there. So like I say, get familiar with these, get to where you can use them easily to predict whether a compound is soluble or not. That's the first step in being able to predict whether double displacement reactions with precipitation will proceed. So let's look at an example. So first, what we're gonna do is take our reactants. So these are both in aqueous solutions. So notice this aqueous, that means that these compounds are both soluble. They dissolve into ions into, in solution. Now, the possible products after we do our switcheroo, sodium is gonna pair with chloride, sodium chloride, and sulfate is gonna pair with strontium, so that's strontium sulfate. And what we're gonna do now is look at the solubility rules and see if one or both of those compounds are soluble. So let's go ahead and apply the solubility rules to each compound. So looking at sodium chloride first, let's look at the ionic sodium compounds. So basically we're just looking at sodium plus. It says they're all soluble. Now um, for chloride, all ionic chloride compounds are soluble unless they're with silver, mercury, or lead. Strontium chloride, sodium sulfide, those are both soluble, okay? And so as we saw these in our reactants, they're both soluble. So again, as I mentioned, those, that AQ label means that they're dissolved in solution. Now, let's look at the possible products. The possible products are sodium chloride and strontium sulfate. So sodium chloride, same rule as we just looked at, sodium cations are always soluble and chloride is unless it's with silver, mercury, or lead, and so that means that sodium chloride is soluble, it's soluble in solution. What about strontium sulfate? So remember on the chart, sulfate ions, compounds that involve sulfate ions are generally soluble, but strontium is an exception. So let's go ahead and look at the chart and confirm that for ourselves. So we can see here, compounds of sulfate are generally soluble, but here is our exception, strontium two plus. So that means this compound is actually, strontium sulfate is actually insoluble. So if it's insoluble, that means it's gonna be a precipitate and it's gonna fall out of solution. So that actually means that this reaction will occur. So we take sodium sulfate, react it with strontium chloride, both of them soluble, we're going to produce soluble sodium chloride in solution and we're going to end up with strontium sulfate solid. Notice that solid uh, phase label that tells us that that is a precipitate. And generally you're going to see a visual change uh, corresponding to this, uh, to this process. So let's just take a look at that, that looks like. So there we are. So then you can see the precipitate at the bottom of the container. All right, so let's do a few more examples. So go ahead and write out the products for these two reactions and determine whether they are soluble or insoluble. Okay, so let's look at the first one. So we have calcium nitrate and potassium bromide. And both of those are soluble. So go to the solubility rules and check those and make sure for yourself, make sure that you can see why those two are soluble. Now, let's write the double re replacement products. So we have calcium bromide and potassium nitrate. So remember, bromide anion is soluble unless it's with silver, lead, or mercury, and it's with calcium, so it's soluble. Um, any compound that involves potassium cation is gonna be soluble. Same goes for the nitrate anion, so this is definitely soluble. Now, um, since they're both soluble, that means that no precipitate would form, and that also means that there's no reaction. So basically you dissolve everything in there together and they all just look at each other. So no reaction, everything is soluble. All right, let's take sodium hydroxide and iron chloride. And so uh, according to those rules, 
both uh, sodium hydroxide and iron chloride are soluble. So remember chloride anion anions are soluble unless it's silver, lead, or mercury, and we have iron, so it's soluble. And sodium hydroxide, uh, anything with sodium cation is gonna be soluble. The possible products are sodium chloride and iron hydroxide. We remember that sodium chloride is soluble, but let's look at iron hydroxide. And that is actually not soluble. It is not one of our exceptions. So when we write out the equation, we're going to put an S label there showing that that's a solid, that's a precipitate because it's insoluble. So we're going to take sodium hydroxide, aqueous, dissolved in solution, iron chloride, aqueous, dissolved in solution, we're going to produce sodium chloride, aqueous, and iron hydroxide, solid, as a product. Okay, so just to summarize, double re replacement reactions basically exchange the cations or the anions of the two ionic compounds and form two new products. If we have a precipitation reaction, it's a double displacement reaction in which one of the products is a solid precipitate. And we're going to use solubility rules to predict whether that reaction will occur. In other words, we're going to use solubility rules to determine whether a precipitate will fall out of solution. So be sure to practice using your solub solubility rules to predict which substances are insoluble. And again, as usual, it gets easier the more that you do it.